Now, I'm sure all of you are thinking, has Marissa gone insane? <laughs> no! I'm dancing like a lame. When was the first time I heard that? It's going to be about nine years ago. I'm as old as a fossil so on 29. Back in 2014, Taylor Swift released this song, and I swear this is relevant. Shake it off. The King of Awesome did a parody where they were dancing like a lame. And I was watching, and I'm going, hmm, who the heck is a lame? I, I had to think about this. I, I did a Google search, sure enough. A lame from Sidefell. I'm like, hmm. Then I asked myself, the Key of Awesome caters to a young audience, most of whom were either in diapers or non-existent whenever the show was actually airing and running. Now there's just reruns, obviously. But it just shows you what kind of magnitude the show had for someone like the Key of Awesome to be confident enough that people will know what they're talking about and the references to the song. I'm going to be getting in more into that soon. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Now the fans. First off, we have my boyfriend, Adam Sidehammer, he's 30. And the people I interviewed for this study are going to be Mr. and Mrs. T, Michelle and Jim. These people I met them through Postmasters, and if you don't know what that is, it's basically a public speaking group. I'm going to transfer a chapter with them. Michelle was the president. They're both in their 50s, and I've known them for a few years now. They love Seinfeld. I'm going to be getting into the nitty gritty the research questions here. Now, I came up with them, I'm going to say two thirds of the way into the interview. I went in thinking, okay, I'm just going to let a fan talk about what they talk about, see where it goes. And I came up with these questions. Do the producers and writers really know what's going on? Do they really know what their fans want? And following off of that and branch off of it immediately is, are they successful in doing so? I'm going to dive in a little deeper now. Some of the quotes here coming up. But first, let's discuss the methodology. And we have a quote from Dr. Kornsky from a few weeks ago. She said, qualitative research is textual, it uses examples, text, and narrative as evidence. There's no single meaningful truth. And that's just the thing. There's no, in this type of research, there's no two plus two equals four kind of thing. It's all based on opinion, thought, and fear. Now, the specific type of quantitative or qualitative research, sorry. It's going to be the ethnography, in this case, a microethnography, to be, so I only interviewed a couple. But it's described as focusing on the understanding of a cultural phenomenon from the perspective of members of said culture. The interviewing, you want thick descriptive, you want nice, long, rich texts, as we've been seeing all day up to now. And I hope I can deliver this as well. Methods, as I mentioned before, interviews, I got a lot of nice, thick quotations from both of the keys. They're both avid fans, and this they celebrate best and best, which I'll get into soon. And I mostly talk about the thoughts on their, their thoughts of characters, their favorite episodes. Then eventually we went into endings, which inspired me to come up with a question. Continued. Just field research, which is basically all I did was sit on the couch at my boyfriend's place, cuddle with him, and watch some Seinfeld. That was really it. But what I found so interesting was that he was kind of cuddling with me one minute and then leaning forward watching the tent for the next. Like this. You know how you lean forward when you're on the edge of your seat? It was almost like he watched it for the first time. And I actually got an answer to this phenomenon whenever I asked the teens about distractions. And this is pretty much the attitude I got from Adam, but here's a quote. It says, because there's so much that you're not paying attention to, you miss something. 
And so I still pay attention to these because I know there are things that I didn't see the first time around. That's what I'm looking for. What did I miss? <coughs> I think this is what Adam was thinking the whole time when he was watching it as well. Moving on to some of the more memorable episodes, the Soup Nazi being one of the most iconic of all time. Here's a picture, it's actually a Christmas postcard. No well for you. No soup for you is a real line. No soup for you. <laughs> this is the actor for the Soup Nazi, Larry Thomas. He was very aggressive, very irate about how he ordered you soup, your soup. Don't you dare get anything wrong. He doesn't even like your case if you're out. You're going for you. <laughs> but they got to meet the actor for him, who was probably nicer in real life because he would have just taken some out if he was just out of character. And if you look at his t shirt real close, it says Master of My Domain, which is actually a reference to a different episode that he wasn't even in. And I just wanted to comment on the fact that this is a one-off character from actually two episodes if you include now. But he showed up in only one of the main episodes. And yet he's at this comic con, the, the Steel City Con from 2012. How much would it take for you to build a base off of just this one episode for the actor from that one episode to show up at something like that? It's mind-boggling, to say the least. Next, we have the Festivus Pole. This is based on another very iconic episode, which in the show, it's actually December 23rd, uh, Dr. Kowalski's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> However, yes, it's celebrated near Christmas, but it's nothing like Christmas. This is the decoration, and it's just basically this, this steel Broad and a tree base that Michelle bought at the Lowe's surprise gym one, one time. She actually brought in a festive pole to her job one time and her, her boss went nuts. And sure enough, it's been a few years since she's been out of that job. And yet, he still sends her every single year a picture of the Festivus pole. <laughs> People do this, I'm telling you. Next, I want to touch base on the good show, bad ending thing. This is more of what I was getting into with the research questions. So here we go. I have a few of the shorter quotes. So Michelle said, there was no ending. It just ended. It's exactly how it started. It just ended. And the end was, you know, just went in and said, this one's sitting in the jail cell. Michelle was like, that's why I think it's so disappointing, because you never thought She began to compare, her and Jim began to compare the to other shows. Lost is a great example of this, and here's what she said about Lost. When it comes to Lost, it's one of those shows where I think every single person, and there were millions upon millions of people watching that show, every single person who watched it probably could have come up with a better ending than the Raiders did. Wow. I asked them, I said, do you think that, is there anybody you know, if you try to fill in the blanks from Seinfeld's ending, do you know anybody who's offered an, an explanation or an alternative? And they said no. Because it's so outlandish, and it's just so, there's so much at once, and you can't really play around with the narrative. It's just there. And I think the term we're looking for is the semiotic access the polysemy, it seems to be lacking there because with loss, millions and millions of people said, I had a different ending. This could have been so much better. But with Seinfeld, people were like, what was that? It, it was terrible, but what was that? I can't, I can't even, what is this? So this is something I found rather interesting in the uh, search. I wanted to ask also, and I did welcome them talking about other shows because it is very much relevant here. I asked why do so many of the endings suck? And Jim said, it's simply because they're so hard to end. People are so accustomed to 
you can't please everyone. You can't please everyone. And shows have been going on for a long time. It's almost like having a pet. The pet dies. It's like the finale after the pet dies, you're like, it's sad. No matter what. So even if the finale is fantastic, which they really are, that's what Jim's favorite is. But here's what Michelle said, and this really answered my questions. Some of these, there's a definite ending that they could go down on, but they don't, and I think that's the problem. They try to do something off the wall and very different from what people actually want, and it ends up not going so well. There you have it. It basically answers the question itself. So the, the research questions to both of them, I'm going to say yes and no. I, I feel like they have a pretty good idea, a pretty good connection, because look at Pessimist, for example. This was based on real life, one of the writers. This is what his dad would do, which was this made up crazy holiday with the same exact traditions they showed on the show, right? And it, he decided to wrongly write it into the show itself. And it was a hit. So in a way, yes, they do know what we want, but on the other hand, no. Because when you're doing an ending, I'm thinking, if people are going to be sad, do it more delicately. Don't be daring. That is the one time I say don't be daring, and I think that's the real problem. So this is what I'm figuring out with this. So to both questions, I'm going to say it's just yes and no. And what did we learn? Just that. That they seem to know what we want, but when the going gets hard, they kind of panic and it ends up on the wayside. This is the same thing with reboots, like with uh, if there's a different writer or there are different actors that can offset people too. So that's another risky thing. Or I'm going to say the answer is more no or yes, but they're trying and failing. This is what I got out of today. The rewatchability of Seinfeld is. Phenomenal. My boyfriend, even with these episodes that you've seen several times over, he's watching it like he's watching an intense football game for the first time since it premieres. It's truly unbelievable. But I want to say kudos to all these shows that have came and went, such as Friends, Lost, all the good show about ending too. All of them. So they have the rewatchability. They act as a, a certain time travel. The show itself is like time travel. And Netflix, Hulu, whatever, it's like a time machine. Now, given the weather is good and it's not raining and it doesn't screw up the connection, but yeah, that's really the only time the time machine doesn't work. But kudos to all of them, and let's enjoy the time machines we have today. Thank you.